So just a slight correction. I'm not the director of the whole unit. So that's Sylvia Richardson. Uh, so I, I'm a, a director of the, uh, there's a trials methodology research group within the unit, which uh, is looking primarily at ad adaptive trials. So I'm going to talk about adaptive biomarker trials. How do I move this? Okay. Uh, I'm going to start off by describing a few simple designs and, uh, and then talk about an adaptive enrichment design for a single arm trial. And then I'm going to look at uh, something with multiple treatments. So uh, the basic uh, design that maybe, I don't know, is this a gold standard? Maybe if you've got a biomarker, you want to look at a marker by treatment interaction. Uh, where you test people first for the biomarker uh, and then you form your strata of biomarker positive and negative and you randomize to experimental uh, treatment or control. And then you test uh, primarily you're powering the study for an interaction. So I've got one of these trials in, in hypertension. Uh, it's a crossover de design in hypertension where we did uh, stratify and we were stratifying by uh, uh, self-reported ethnicity. But um, like with all these things, is this, I, I don't know, is this better than a uh, retrospective analysis? Well, uh, you can gain more power because you're pre-specifying the, the, the number of people in each of your strata, so you can try and balance it and get more power. But like our trial, uh, although they've uh, powered it for an interaction with ethnicity and e equal numbers in each of the three strata of ethnicity, they've got loads of uh, biomarkers and metabolomics and and so they're going to do a data dredge probably afterwards as a secondary or tertiary analysis. Uh, but this is, you know, these are huge trials. Uh, and often people come to you and say, uh, I don't want to waste my time on a biomarker negative. All I want to do is, is a pure enrichment trial. Uh, why would I spend the time? Obviously, you can't then uh, estimate the interaction. Uh, and it is hard to argue when someone's got a small budget, why, why would they spend the money on powering an interaction when they can just test whether the treatment in, in a biomarker positive group would uh, work or not. Obviously, it doesn't tell you whether it's predictive, but they kind of assume it might be. Or you can do something like an adaptive enrichment where you're recruiting all sorts of patients. Uh, here I've uh, got a mixture of, say, red and blue people. And then you take an interim analysis and then decide at the interim analysis whether there's a, re a response in both of those subgroups. And if there is, then you go on to a second stage where you study the whole uh, population. Or if you notice that you know, there isn't a, enough evidence of response in, say, the blue people, then you uh, adaptively enrich it. Or if there's no response at all, you can stop for futility. So like I said, the, f the first uh, half of my talk will be about single-arm trials. I'm not uh, a mad advocate for single-arm trials, uh, but uh, as adaptive trials go, the Simon two-stage design is the most used adaptive trial. This, people do ask you about single-arm trials, uh, and they're not going away at the moment. Uh, and I'm going to look at this adaptive enrichment study design, which was uh, given by Jones and Holgram in uh, clinical trials uh, some time ago. Uh, their paper wasn't exactly the clearest paper because, uh, you know, I don't know, some of the description of the maths was uh, a bit shaky, and they didn't really talk about the hypothesis testing part of uh, their design very much. And they certainly didn't look at optimal designs. I think they just had quite a convenience uh, design which they wanted to describe, uh, and it didn't really hit any of the error probabilities that you'd normally see in a, in a trial. So, and when we're talking about optimal designs here, uh, we're looking at minimizing the expected sample size at the null hypothesis, the global null. But there are obviously other uh, alternatives to that. So I'm just... Um, and the aim of this trial is uh, generally, you know, the, in the cancer field, uh, your outcome is generally a resist criteria where, you know, response or activity is uh, what they're after and, and how they categorize, you know, things is, you know, we've tried publishing paper to try and get people on continuous tumor response and, you know, it gets published, but uh, it is quite hard to change practice. And then um, they wanted to determine whether this drug has an activity in the, uh, a target population or, or as a whole and selected. Uh, so single arm trials, what do people do them? Well, they're, they're really powerful because uh, you don't have a comparison. So obviously you're, you're reducing your um, uh, variability, but obviously uh, you're comparing to just some single value and it's, it's not a randomized trial. But in a biomarker setting, actually, you need to have quite a, a larger sample size, even for single-arm trials. 
and, and they based their design on a Simon II stage design, and then they had this interim analysis to do an adaptive enrichment. So obviously doing a single arm trial, uh, you know, there is a population selection bias uh, of the one arm trial. And, and we, we did some work with a PhD student of mine, Michael Grayling, about whether uh, you could start by doing a single arm trial and then do a randomized trial, or should you do something like a group sequential trial. So we compared like, lots of different uh, sequences of trials to see where, where your optimal strategy was. And the only way a single arm uh, is useful is if uh, the treatment doesn't work. It's, it's, it's there to sort of uh, screen out, you know, drugs that don't work, and that's the whole purpose. Although I don't think people use it for that. And actually, you have to have so much belief in in the treatment not working that you kind of think, why are you doing the trial in the first place? So, so we're not uh, mad advocates, like I said. But it does uh, have some nice, uh, you know, y you can do things exactly. Uh, so it's a nice sort of. Uh, uh, and, you know, designed to sort of demonstrate things. So I'm just going to like recap the Simon two-stage design, and, and I, uh, I mean, essentially they set up a null hypothesis where you're looking at some uh, response, true response p, being, uh, and under the null you say that's equal to p zero, some value that hopefully you got from the literature. Uh, and usually you set up your significance levels and your power, and for this particular design of say 5% significance, 80% power. Uh, and the 80% power is at a response of 25%. You, you discover the optimal design. Here is uh, uh, this two-stage design, and this is how they normally write these things, where the first stage is uh, you, you recruit 12 people. If you get no responses, uh, you stop the study for futility at the interim analysis. If you get more than naught, you, you carry on to the end of the trial. So, and, and the second part of the trial is you recruit another four people uh, and you end by rejecting the null hypothesis if you see greater than two responders from the 16. So like, like I said, because it's a simple design, uh, you can write down exactly what the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis uh, is in terms of actual P, and that just is uh, uh, using uh, you know, cumulative binomial probabilities. So you can write this function out, and then you can, you can see what the shape is. And as, as you can see, you've got uh, at uh, the null response, you've got uh, at 0.05, you get a property rejecting the null of 5%, so that's significance, 80% of power at 0.25. The probability of rejecting the null hypothesis is this, this curve for any value of true response and it's monotonically increasing. So often you see null hypotheses that use an interval of any p less than or equal to the p naught. That's because they do this. Uh, and um, there's a lot of uh, debate in the literature about what the alternative hypothesis is. Uh, I tried to avoid specifying one because I thought it was just uh, p not or greater than or equal to p naught. But some people say it's uh, p greater than or equal to p1 which is this value, but this is the value that you power at. And then people get confused as, oh, what if we're in the middle? I, I, mean, I think they overcomplicate things in this, uh, this field, but it is as simple as this function. And uh, with every value of uh, true response, you get an expected sample size going from the, the interim at 12 all the way to the end of the study, so you know exactly what uh, your characteristics of the trial are. Now, when we come to an adaptive enrichment trial, um, you have two hypotheses, and I'm only restating what Jones and Holgram uh, specified as their hypotheses, but you've got a hypothesis in the unselected, which is P minus. That's not a biomarker minus group. That is everyone. And you've got a, a, a hypothesis in the positive only group, P plus equals to P naught. And if you can reject this, they say you've got efficacy in unselected population. And if you reject this, you've got uh, efficacy in the biomarker positive population. And they assume that there's an order in these probabilities that your biomarker uh, increases your uh, response probability. So they assume this. So the reason why P0 is the same in both of these is I think a priori, uh, under your null hypothesis, uh, you, you're saying your biomarker is not prognostic, and you're looking at it being predictive. Uh, 
and you know, we're going to go for the usual sort of design characteristics. You can relax all these, uh, these assumptions, but I'm not sure whether it's worth it. But this is the schematic of, uh, of the design. Uh, obviously, there's more um, decision criteria, but at the start, you recruit an unselected population. Uh, you then, the first thing you do is check whether there's a large response in the whole population. And if it's really large, you might stop there and say it's a successful trial. If it's not, you're still looking for some response in the whole population. And if there is, you want to recruit the whole population uh, and then do a, a test in the second stage of whether efficacy in the whole population. But if there isn't efficacy in the whole population, you can go to, to just the subgroup of is there efficacy in the positive only subgroup. So that's, that's uh, one route of uh, getting uh, a conclusion in the unselected is you, you do this part of the trial. Uh, and if uh, you, you still, uh, in the second stage, have an unselected population, you still have this chance that you can declare efficacy in the positive only, if, if that's not significant. Or if at the interim uh, there isn't any response in the overall population, you can test for uh, whether there's a response in the positive only group, and if it's massive, you might stop there. Or otherwise, you go over here and recruit positive only people and do a test in positive only people. So you've got three different routes of getting uh, positive results, and, and two of them, these two, are in the positive population, and that one's in the unselected. Now, for every single box, you need uh, to specify some numbers. And, and, and they, in this uh, paper, they, they fixed the, the prevalence of the biomarker. So they fixed uh, 30 were in, you know, I think that's 30 biomarker negatives, and that's 13 positive. So that's how many people you recruit. In practice, to get that probability, you know, you might have to be really flexible about that. But for every stage, if you did set everything, you know exactly how many people of each group you need to recruit at every stage. And all the decisions about your uh, hypothesis testing can all be categorized as uh, being uh, you know, specific numbers for number of responders. So once you've designed this, you can actually write it all down. But as you can see, under the Simon, Simon two-stage design, all you had was four numbers. You had a sample size in the first stage, a sample size in the second stage, and, uh, and your, your rejection, uh, rejection regions. Uh, now you've actually got 10 different numbers in, in this design. So even though we're on a single arm trial with an adaptive, with one interim, with an adaptive enrichment setting, I've now got 10, 10 things I can vary. So it's, uh, so it's quite large, a uh, design. Uh, so this is how we write out the design in, in numbers, just in the first stage. Uh, these are the rejection regions, and these are the sample sizes, and in the in, uh, unselected or the enriched. So there's 10 numbers, and even if you had five choices, you've got 10 million designs. Well, we're quite lucky because uh, we've got a dedicated programmer who helps us out with difficult problems like this, and uh, he does a lot of um, um, parallelization, so he, he does a lot of GPU programming. So he looked through uh, 10 billion designs, uh, and, and he kind of, I mean, when we programmed this up, it just took too long, so we just gave it to him, and he, he solved it fairly quickly. And, and the simple thing he actually did for us was well, not only was parallelization, but also realized that uh, we were calculating the binomial cumulative probabilities too often. And so he, all he did was then constructed a big table for every single value uh, first. So he just looked those up, so he wasn't calculating them. Uh, so that saved a lot of time and then pruned lots of uh, uh, trees. So we did actually manage, I and mean, he did find the optimal design for various situations, and, and we put this into our, into our paper. <coughs> So I'm just going to go through this, this design, one design, and just show you in, in very much like I, I drew, the, drew the line for the rejection probability in the Simon 2 stage. This is the rejection probabilities uh, for, for that design, the adaptive enrichment. And route one was, was the one where you declare efficacy in the unselected population. And you can see it doesn't, it doesn't vary by the response in the positives because that wasn't in that uh, uh, route. But you can see, as, as the response goes up, your probability of uh, rejecting both hypotheses, because that was the conclusion, uh, increases. And under route two, which is the, the one where you, you start off, uh, in the second uh, stage, you still have an unselected population, but it failed 
to show significance in the whole population, and then you test it in the positive-only population, you will see um, that there is a tiny sliver of a chance of rejecting uh, uh, the hypothesis of no efficacy in the positive-only group, and that requires a sort of very small response in, in the negative group, so you, you, uh, enough of a response that you get to not an, enrich the second stage, but not high enough that you reject the probability. And so you get this tiny little sliver. Uh, and obviously, this, is non, uh, this isn't monotonic. Uh, so you can't do any sort of um, uh, you know, look at null, you know, a more complex null hypothesis. This is a, has to stay as a point null. And in route three, uh, route three you only get to route three if, if, if there's no response in the whole population and, and you uh, enrich it in the positive only. And so therefore, as you'd expect, as the probability goes up, your property of rejecting the null uh, goes up in the positive only. And if you, if you put them all together and add them all up, this is, this is the probability of rejecting any hypothesis uh, across every single value of you know, responsive, positive, and minus um, populations. And once you've got this, this function, you can obviously then look at various uh, points and, uh, and look at error probabilities. So just to sort of uh, introduce a few functions. So I'm going to say R1 is the function of uh, probability of rejecting both the nulls via root 1. R2 is the probability of rejecting the, the positive only null hypothesis. And R3 is, is that through the enrichment. So I've got these three uh, rejection probabilities. And so R2, 3 is just adding up 2 and 3, which is the probability of rejecting the positive hypothesis in total. R1, 2, 3 is adding them up. So that is your... Uh, that's this figure here, which is the rejecting any hypothesis. And, and rather than specify an alternative, which Jones and Holcomb did do, I'm just saying that they had interest and they wanted to have enough power when uh, the response probability in the unselected population is 0.15 and in the positive it's 0.25 and it's and or. So they didn't really discuss uh, like specifically what they wanted to power in terms of the and and the or. So if you look at uh, those, those values, I'm just saying this is P1 minus and that is P1 plus as points of interest in your, uh, in your um, uh, design region. Uh, these are those three points. And, and this is the global null, at P0, P0. And this is, a, this is the sample size, um, expected sample size. And obviously, at the null, it's still quite low. It's only about 50 in total. And you go up to you know, roughly about you know, 75 up here. Now, if you look at the uh, re rejection probabilities at the global null, which is this point, uh, you'll see under root 1, it's 3.7%. Under root 2, it's 0.5. And under root 3, it's 0.6. So if you add them all up, you get 4.8, which is less than, uh, uh, say, 5%. And this is the, the actual... Uh, um, type 1 error we wanted to control, which was a summation of all these probabilities. You may want to do something different. So that's exactly what I just said. That's our uh, control of that. Um, you could control other, other things. You could control uh, root 1 to be 2.5% and 2 and 3 to be 2.5%, or you could relax both of those to be um, less than 5%. Obviously, this is much stronger than what we uh, are doing here. Because, as you can see from the diagram, uh, you know, this error is not, you know, that could be less than 2.5 if you wanted to control that one. Now, if you look at the three interesting points, you can then see, you can get a grasp of, of what power is. So, at this, this point was where uh, the unselected was at the null, but the positive was at 0.25. So, obviously, you've got a small chance of rejecting under root 1. Uh, you have a slightly higher end of route 2, 11.5, and then you've got quite a lot in route 3. So, obviously, if, if the response is only in the positive subgroup, you get, you get to an enriched trial more often than not. And if you add this number to this number, you get 80% power at that point, if that is the point you want to power at. Uh, if you look at this diagram, once there's a response of 15% in the unselected population, you get 80% power. For, uh, it doesn't matter what the positive uh, probability is. It's all 80% power. And, and obviously, if you, the best point is if, if 
um, it's, it's, well, best in some sort, that if, if, you, if there was a response in the negative uh, 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 and the unselected of 15% and in the positive of 25%, you get 96% uh, point five of rejecting both those hypotheses, but obviously uh, it's, and it's only, what, 15, 16.3% that you declare it in the positive only, even though there is a slightly higher response in the, problem, in the positive group alone. So what we used as a definition of power was that we wanted the minimum of, of uh, rejecting both these, these two functions to be greater than or equal to 80% power. So that is uh, rejecting the positive uh, hypothesis when you know that the response is only in the positive and uh, rejecting the unselected when uh, you have the 0.15 of the unselected, and it doesn't matter about, obviously, what the, what's happens in the positive. So that's our definition of power. Uh, that was our definition of significance. And, and we, we're saying this is actually only, only weakly controlled because if you start looking at some of the other points, uh, there's a point here where uh, in the unselected, where we got 0.15 in both the subgroups, uh, we have an 8.1% chance of rejecting the positive only hypothesis. Now, I'm sure uh, some people might not care that they've um, rejected the, one, the wrong hypothesis. So we're saying this is a sort of wrong positive, if you like, and whether you want to control a wrong positive or not, uh, that is a debate. But if you do, you can. Uh, you can control the wrong positive to be 5%, or, or you can do you know, various other things. If, obviously, if, if you control the wrong positive of 5%, what happens is you, you get even a uh, lower chance of a false uh, positive under the null. So you're controlling it quite so simply. I don't think you can control it directly. So anyway, if, um, it'd be interesting to know whether people do want to uh, control the wrong positive error. Uh, and just to recap, we, we optimise this in terms of expected sample size. And, and the optimization problem, like I said, is of 10 billion designs. It's, it's an enormous problem. Uh, but we did have some software, and it is available. Uh, whether you can get it to work on your systems, you, know, you can do that via Colin. Uh, and... As we did for the um, single arm trial in drug development plans uh, and decided that it wasn't useful other than when you haven't got a treatment effect, it's not quite clear whether the same works in uh, biomarker trials given that there's uh, lots of different ways of doing it. So that's one possible avenue of, of uh, inspecting that. So I'm going to go on to, to look at multiple experimental treatments now where we've got several, several experimental treatments available for for testing, and, and I've got to say that this work is um, done with someone entirely different. This is with James Wason, so James Wason did most of the, the computing for this. Uh, and, and here, um, when you talk about ex multiple experimental treatments and several arms, you can put that in an umbrella trial. Uh, and some of the benefits are having the shared control group, uh, you're going to increase your statistical efficiency, so you can test more treatments with the same number of centers. Uh, it's administratively and log logistically easier to compare to separate trials. So they are gaining uh, uh, you know, you know, popularity, especially in the UK, uh, multi-R, multi-stage trials. And you're hoping that the, um, uh, the patients will receive, uh, are more likely to receive a treatment because there's fewer people on control. Uh, but obviously these are a lot more complicated. So in, we're going to talk about three sets of different designs that um, there's some examples of in the UK and the US. So parallel trials. Uh, so here you, you have a set of different parallel trials in, in, and a patient is allocated to a trial on the basis of some biomarker profile. And there's two examples in the UK, the National Lung Matrix Trial and Focus 4. And, and they all use uh, adapted design approaches to stop, stop stub trials when a treatment's not working in a particular subgroup. So this is sort of, uh, this is for the National Lung Matrix trial, where you've got your unselected population, you're doing some sequencing on them, and then you're deciding which trial they should go in. And you're assuming that all these um, treatments are uh, 
selected for that uh, biomarker of interest. And then, as a lot of people probably know here, the Bayesian adaptive randomization approach, which, uh, makes it, uh, it, it doesn't make any assumptions like these are sort of linking biomarkers to treatment. Well, in, in, in a lot of Bayesian adaptive randomization, it's, it's not making those assumptions of links between the treatments and biomarkers. I battle an ice by. Uh, and obviously, uh, looking at your success uh, probabilities in each of the subgroups, and then you're uh, adapting the allocation ratio as, as you do the interim analyses. And, and that way, it's you know, deemed positive for patients because they're more likely to get a treatment that is uh, successful for them. And therefore, you know, these should uh, increase recruitment rates. I think that's certainly uh, uh, found in these trials. And we, we thought about uh, another um, type of design where, you, you know, you've already sort of a priori thought about this treatment might work with a certain biomarker. Yes, there might be some off, uh, uh, you know, this treatment might work in another subgroup, but you just don't know. But, you know, a priori, that's what you're linking your treatment with uh, the biomarker. So we, this is this kind of sort of intermediate uh, approach between a, uh, a Bayesian uh, uh, adaptive randomization design, and this is sort of uh, with this linking. And this is all covered in, in this trial uh, and in this paper in much more de detail than I'm going through. So, like I said, you're going to try and link uh, treatments with uh, biomarkers and, uh, and, and then have a sort of shared control. And there are several designs that we could look at. But in, in Cambridge, we, we've been talking to a group uh, in uh, the breast cancer group, and, uh, and they're finding it... Because we're like a, a small centre in Cambridge compared to the largest sort of cancer centres, there's a lot of competition for, for patients. So when you come up with something new, it, it takes a long time before they're going to implement a design. But uh, recently, there was a Japanese trial that showed that capsetabine uh, can improve long-term disease-free survival after surgery in some subgroups. And like I said, these uh, collaborators in the University of Cambridge, and in fact, they have like um, um, a massive amount of uh, you know, genome and technology that is at their fingertips, so they can sort of try and link that technology with, with trials. So they don't have to send off the samples very far. And they want to design a, a trial that was, it would, would target agents at this uh, group of poor prognosis the group of pro poor prognosis they deem is something to do with circulating tumour DNA, which is a technique that they're trying to investigate in Cambridge. And so should you give different uh, treatments to some of these people? So that their, their primary endpoint wants to be this uh, a log percentage change in circulating tumour DNA, uh, change from baseline to six months. And their uh, poor prognosis is, is through their immunology and cycle cell uh, gene panels. So, but they're going to uh, pick biomarkers that are moderately prevalent, at, say about 30% each. And every treatment arm includes capsetabine as a control, and then you have these two targeted agents that are linked to the biomarkers. Now, I can't write down what these are because they're still in negotiating with uh, uh, companies in order to find the, the right treatments for some of the biomarkers that they're interested in. So it's, uh, it's quite uh, uh, ambitious. Uh, it's always quite difficult to get multiple drug companies uh, involved in, in a single trial. Uh, so fingers crossed this year we might get somewhere. But the sort of design they're thinking of is that they start with 100 patients uh, and r randomize between control and experimental arms. But if you're positive for both the uh, immunological markers and the cycle cell, if you're positive for both, then you go into a, a three-arm trial where uh, you've got the immunology-linked treatment and the cycle cell-linked treatment as two arms. But if you're only positive for one of these, like the immunology-only, then you'll get the immunology-only possible comparison. And, and some, same with the cycle cell. And then after the 100 uh, patients where you've got this balanced randomization for most of it, you then do an interim analysis and, uh, and you do a series of interim analyses and then you change the allocation probabilities based on the results. The results are fitted through uh, uh, from this, the log of this uh, circulating tumor DNA ratio uh, versus an overall mean 
uh, beta um, parameters for each of the treatment effects. Uh, and these are the, just the biomarker effects, the marginal biomarker, and this is the interaction between treatment and biomarker. So our, our, our treatment effects of uh, uh, are a combination of, of this and this. So uh, your allocation probabilities depend on both of these. And, and the all allocation probabilities are, are, are the usual thing where you, you take the probability of treatment success divided by the sum of all the probabilities according to some power, which you, uh, at the start of a trial, you want to be more balanced and become less balanced as you go through it. So it's the usual sorts of functions that people use. And it uses a Bayesian model for the uh, allocation probabilities at the interim. And, and all the parameters are, are vague apart from two, which is the, the, these are the treatment biomarker interactions. So whether you've uh, got biomarker one uh, and treatment one, then you're, uh, this is informative because we want to put more people on linked treatments than unlinked treatments. So even though we have the linking, it's not impossible that you come in as biomarker one and you're given treatment two, uh, especially if, it, if this isn't uh, working very well, if this is low. But at the start, these are kept as informative in order to bias the design towards linked uh, treatments. And, and like, like I've only sort of vaguely mentioned what the allocation probabilities are, but most of the detail is in a supplementary document uh, on the uh, British Journal of Cancer webpage. And at the end, we're, we're going to do a frequentist analysis, which is just the linear regression with the same uh, uh, parameters. And, same. and we're going to do, uh, uh, we're going to test the effect of uh, treatment. Well, you can test the, uh, the experimental treatment one uh, in biomarker two positive people. So these are the sort of unlinked hypotheses. So you can, you can test all these hypotheses. And uh, we did a little work on, on how many interims would be um, informative after the first interim. And it, and it turns out that you don't want to go beyond five interim analyses. So in, in a sort of practical way, this, this isn't too much of a burden on the, on the study team. And, and just to sort of summarize results between the sort of three designs of parallel tri trials, uh, Bayesian adaptive randomization and the linked Bayesian adaptive ra randomization. If treatment works, one works in all patients, you can see pretty much power is similar across all the designs. If treatment work, one works in biomarker one patients, i.e. it's linked, there's a, a little bit more power in the linked. There's still quite a lot of power in the, the Bayesian adaptive randomization and, and there's still uh, a reasonable amount of power in the parallel designs. When you get an unlinked treatment, so treatment one works better in biomarker two positive patients, you get very low power for the parallel trials. You get most power with the Bayesian adaptive randomization, but uh, this doesn't do so, so badly, even though it wasn't designed for an unlinked treatment. And, and they all have similar type one error rates. So this is, the, this is the worst case scenario where we've only got two linked treatments. As you, as you get more and more linked treatments, there are more and more off-link, unlinked uh, effects. And actually, the linked uh, um, approach uh, g gains a larger difference between these two powers. And, and yet, it still doesn't do so badly against uh, Bayesian adaptive randomization. So there is some, uh, some positive benefit there. So just to, to conclude, uh, the paper shows a lot more comparisons that I'm doing here. Um, and when the tre Bayesian uh, treatment links are correct, uh, you know, parallel trials is best because obviously you're not wasting any time on off treatment effects. Uh, but the linked, uh, our linked uh, Bayesian adaptive randomization is very close. And uh, Bayesian adaptive randomization loses a little bit of, of power, but still pretty good. And when links are incorrect, then the Bayesian adaptive randomization is definitely best. Uh, but we don't do so badly in terms of the linking but the parallel trials has, has very low power. So just uh, going to end with a few thanks for all these people who are involved in these, these two bits of work. Cheers. Yeah, just just because... Um, it's, it's an early phase two trial, so we're allowing quite a high uh, probability. 
I mean, when you're, when you're thinking about phase two error rates, I can't remember who, who Nigel Stallard did a paper on, on what sort of error rate you should you propose. And it's, if you think about an optimal drug development plan, then, then in phase two, you're, you're happy to accept a few positive hits, false positives to get through, because you're eventually going to do a confirmatory trial. It's, no, so I don't, I don't think people are sort of investing a lot of time in terms of, of thinking about the whole drug development and what sort of series of trials you're going to do and what's the best overall strategy. We did it for single arm trials, but uh, even even when we were looking through the literature of, of trying to find out whether someone had done a single arm trial that, uh, followed up by a randomized trial, we couldn't find in the literature any examples of linking of that. And often, like, the phase three trials looked at a different population and then started doing combinations. I, I don't know, the literature is not very good for sort of looking at the whole drug development plans. Well, maybe a follow-up question is that in, in the, um, the area in which sort of more generally single arm trials have been used a lot is where there's historical information from the control group. But there most people seem to have come to the conclusion that what you need to do is you need to have a look at the way in which that varies from trial to trial. So that using a, a single standard But, yeah, but surprising that they're still the most used adaptive trial. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's, I think there's a, a conference in Austria. And, you know, Vienna is going to have a session on debating on single-arm trials, and uh, I'm sure statisticians have come to the conclusion that they're not worth... You know, there was a push in Britain to sort of get more randomised phase two trials, so, I mean, they're increasing, but if you've got a single clinician in a hospital, that they can recruit ten people to a trial they generally do single arm trials and it's hard to convince them to do a randomized trial. Yeah, it's... Are there other people who kind of 
suggest how that P1, you know, alternative hypothesis comes about? Uh, yeah, that's if you want to specify an alternative or not, isn't it? Uh, in some sense, you've got. Then you need to, to power the study, right? Well, you can you can tell the power any any possible response, isn't it? So do you need, you know, how do they specify it? Yeah, good question. It should be a clinically rel relative rel it's difference. Not easy but to yeah. That, right? Yeah. Yeah. So how do you think it? So, uh, so for example, if all the response rate is high, that could be essentially, for example, very low response. But overall, you know, when you take average, it seems okay. And I think the other strategy, I don't remember who or whatever, probably did. So the other way is you can look both cost and active, which are good enough, and then you, you uh, for example, combine them to kind of like unselected. Because that's going to kind of uh, Yeah, and no, I can see. I, I can see like what you want to do in an interim is see is there a differential response, and then make a decision like that. But obviously, as soon as you take a difference of those probabilities, you got higher variance. It's gonna it's gonna lose power over that yeah. that assumption. Yeah. And uh, yeah, well, I think in single arm trials they're always trying to maximise power without yeah. <laughs> doing too much. It does exist, yeah. Whether it's uh, circulatable <laughs> is, a, is a different matter. It's because because of the power is so the ten ten different things you're searching over. So my ado file wasn't very quick, which is why we got Colin on board. And uh, I think uh, what's the, I think I think he just used Paralyzer C. And uh, but that is available on our on our website. I think it should work for, for most systems if it's in C. As long as your compiler can do it, it should be fine. I think it's that impatient of users. If they have a bit of software, I think they want an answer now. I'm trying to calculate the sample size. I want it now. And, and to do a sample size for that, it would probably take a few hours in state. And no one's going to wait that long. But that, I mean, in, in lots of supplementary t tables on the on the paper, we cover a lot of different possibilities. So if people want to uh, look it up, they can. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that you have a 